So th this uh, video is part of the time capsule uh, project of the International Association of Hydrogeology and it is part of a series of uh, videos related to uh, Guylain de Marcilly, who is here today. So Guylain is professor at the University of Paris 6 in Paris and he's a member of the Academy of Science in, in Paris too. And uh, uh, today we will mainly uh, talk with Jean-Pierre Delhomme about the, the work that Guylain and Jean-Pierre have done on geostatistics. This were, was really the introduction of geostatistics in the world of hydrogeology. And um, later on we will talk about the, the, the career, the full career of, of Guylain. But to start uh, about this aspect about geostatistics, I would like to give the, the, the floor to uh, Jean-Pierre, who was one of the first PhD students, I guess, of, of Guilain, that's right. And uh, after he made a career in Schlumberger, uh, in geophysics, and back in, the, in water in, uh, in this, during in the last years. And uh, I give you now uh, maybe the, the opportunity to start this discussion. Thank you. Uh, so, uh at two occasions, we, uh, I mean, Guillain and myself, uh, had the opportunity to, to revisit uh, what was done uh, during all those years uh, at uh, Ecole des Mines. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, first time it, it was uh, 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 when we wrote uh, a paper about uh, the uh, history or the, the, the evolution of uh, the way of handling uh, inverse problems in hydrogeology. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, we, we did that during uh, the summer 99. And the paper was issued in 2000, year to, in the year 2000. And um, uh, later on, uh, uh, in, let's say, 2005 or so, uh, both of us again uh, had to to, uh, to to reconsider uh, what uh, was done at, at in, in Fontainebleau uh, as a contribution uh, um, to uh, a book uh, which was enti entitled a "Tribute to Georges Matron" after. after uh, uh, Georges Matron passed away, and uh, this this time the, the focus was no longer on uh, on the inverse problems and the interaction with with the statistics, but it was more on uh, on the uh, the impact of uh, of the probabilistic uh, approach uh, in the way of uh, handling flow and transport phenomena. Which was, you know, was a more, maybe le less practical and a, a, a little a bit more theoretical. Uh, so today it's a kind of a third time we uh, we have to 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 do the more, more or less the same exercise, but uh, uh, in the two previous uh, instances. Uh, because it was written documents that we, we are producing, uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, the, the, the flesh of the history w w was missing. It was um, mostly boats uh, that, we, that we, we are, we are uh, producing. And uh, that's, that's why uh, I think it would be good to 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 have uh, recorded uh, now the the uh, uh, how all that started, and uh, that's that's the first uh, question I would like uh, uh, you, Guillain, to 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 comment on or to, or to answer. It's uh, uh, in in your in your uh, memory uh, how. The even the, the, the word statistics or, or the, the, the concept of statistics came to your mind 
and uh, and to uh, sort of a large part of your life because it, it, <laughs> it took you years to, to go to go through that, this, this concept. Yes, uh, it's a bit far away since it was in the late 60s, 1967, 68, all these things happened. Um, I had just started doing mathematical hydrogeology at École des Mines in Fontainebleau in 67. And more or less at the same time, Georges Matron uh, came also to the School of Mines in Fontainebleau. And he had opened a center which was called Geostatistics and essentially working on estimation for the mining industry. Uh, so my colleague Yves Selem and I were quite interested in uh, what Matron was doing. So the first thing we did was to go and uh, follow one of the seminars that Matron organized in the teaching of geostatistics. Um, let me stop an, a minute to thank uh, Philippe uh, to have this uh, time capsule, as you call it, uh, about uh, what I've done in the past. It's a pity that some similar time capsule could not have been done for Matron. Matron was a great, great, great person, and I owe a lot of, of what I did later on to Georges Matron, and it would have been uh, great. As far as I know, there is a video. There is a video? There is a video. Jean-Paul Gilles told me. Oh, he wanted well, to give it that. to me. Yeah. Anyway, he should be in my seat and uh, talk about <laughs> geostatistics if we want to reconstruct the history of geostatistics. He was a, a major player in, in the history since he understood flow in post media. He had written in the late, early 60s, I would say, a little book which is for a theory of post media, which is very difficult to read, but uh, who, who shows how good understanding he had of uh, hydrogeology, flow in, in post media, and also of the role of the stochastic concept that it could be played in, uh, in using stochastic theories for, f with flow equations. Anyway, to, to go back to the story, so we've, I followed this uh, geo, geostatistics seminar, which was very much oriented at the time to mining. And I must confess I had difficulties to see how that could be transplanted or transported or adapted to, to our problem of hydrogeology. But fortunately, uh, Jean-Pierre came. Jean-Pierre came to Fontainebleau and uh, somehow uh, I remember. I don't remember if you also followed later on the second year this seminar. Mm -hmm. huh? I was uh, sent to this seminar. You were sent <laughs> to this <laughs> seminar. <laughs> yes, we, MCL and I, we, we said, well, there's something to, to take on this statistic, but how exactly this can be done? Let's have a younger person like Jean-Pierre <laughs> go and try to make sense of all these uh, concept variograms and uh, probabilities and all that. So Jean-Pierre was asked to go follow I wouldn't say be a spy in geostatistics, but a little bit. You know, there were two different groups, and uh, we would like to see what benefit we could take from using geostatistical concepts. And uh, we had already, um, you know, problems that we wanted to solve, which in a way uh, opened the way for geostatistics. And the first was that we need to have values of parameters in space, so we need a tool that can take measurements and then build a map of, of what uh, the value is on a regular grid. Of course, the statistics can do that. And also, we had an understanding that uh, whatever method you use to interpolate, to, to fill uh, boxes in a, in a grid of a model with values, there was an uncertainty. So this uncertainty had to be measured, quantified, estimated, and uh, so these two problems, we had them even before we started to hear from visual statistics. What was difficult is to say, well, this is a problem, and geostatistics is indeed the way to solve it. And this, this in fact, is the, I think, the, the mission, you the mission <laughs> that Jean-Pierre received. And uh, the, eventually, uh, he did so well in, in uh, exploiting this avenue. Maybe you can start with telling us which problems you started with to deal with first? But uh, it, there were two two problems that uh, obviously related to each other. Uh, one was the the real concern I had as, as a student uh, uh, having to to build a, a multi-layer model. It was to 
to, 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 build, to build up a, a set of uh, toxicity data for, for all this, this stack of, uh, of aquifers and all that. But it was, at the, at the very beginning, something perceived as, as quite difficult. Uh, and also, I had the problem of interpolating uh, uh, psychometric maps. And th that was so after uh, uh, having uh, uh, attended the, the seminar, uh, the Matros seminar, I, I decided it would be maybe wiser to, to start by uh, psychometric maps. So I, I tried to, to investigate, uh, to ask questions, uh, how, how could mm -hmm. I do so. And it, I was very fortunate because at that time, it, it, it's, it dates back to, to, <laughs> to the early, to, 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 to uh, 1970. Uh, it happened that uh, the, um, what is called the universal credging, that means credging with a trend or with a drift, had just been uh, created uh, by uh, Georges Matron uh, and his team in order to, to, um, to solve uh, a, a problem uh, which was totally different from uh, our problem, uh, and we, which was the, the, the problem of, uh, of um, uh, mapping C-bottom uh, depths or C-bottom elevation. And obviously, when you, when you come uh, near the shoreline, the shoreline, there is a, a, a definite trend. Uh, the, the, the depth uh, decreases with, uh, when you, 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 you reach the, 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 shore, the shoreline. And for piezometric uh, maps, I had the same, the same problem because, uh, uh, because of the the uh, regional gradient in, uh, in aquifers, we had, a, we had a trend. So I was very fortunate. The tool was brand new, created uh, w when I came. So I, I imported it uh, uh, to, to the Center for uh, Groundwater Studies from the Center for Statistics and uh, tried to, 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 to start working, working on that. And it's only, so, with <coughs> some difficulties, some success after the, the difficulties and all that. And it's only after we, we, we more or less uh, cracked this, uh, this first problem of, uh, of uh, geometric maps, then we came to the, 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 the issue of uh, what could be done uh, for uh, transitivity. Uh, so it took us, uh, when I say us, it was really us because it was discussion between the, the uh, Matron's team, the Matron's group. Uh, by that time, I, I, uh, I sort of uh, formed a, a small uh, uh, team uh, with two guys from this, uh, with Ma from uh, Matron uh, Center, uh, Pierre Delfinier and Jean-Paul Chiles, and, and myself, and we started to, to write code uh, because there were, there were no very good code of, and all that. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the one hand, on the, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, <coughs> the, 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 the Guillain and, and, and the guys we were joining, uh, uh, really, we were really joining the, the team uh, uh, in, in, in hydrogeology, uh, we started to, 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 to address this, this issue of uh, what to do with, for, for transmissivity. It took us, I don't know, maybe months to, to understand that uh, the real variable was log transitivity rather than transitivity. Uh, and, and it and this occurred in parallel to uh, the efforts that uh, uh, Guillain already described in, in his discussion with uh, Doherty uh, about uh, inverse problem solving. Yes. So we, we had that in, in parallel. And, and more or less, uh, uh, so we had so a way to get basometric maps with confidence intervals, mm -hmm. a way to handle uh, log transitivity maps when we had data, including data of different qualities and all that, and, 
and a missing link, and, uh, and, and then it, it was uh, the time you, you started to, 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 to think of uh, uh, pilot points and, and all that. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more or less it's, uh, in terms of, uh, of time frame, it's, it's almost at that time. In my, in, in my remembrance, I can, cannot say exactly. Yes, I, I'm not going to repeat what I said the, the other time on, on the inverse problem, but the pilot points which uses the principle that uh, spatial trans trans transmissivities are spatially correlated, came directly out of the work of Jean-Pierre, who had shown that indeed, if you take the log transmissivity, then you can find a structure, and uh, we, you, you looked at several aquifers, and we could see that indeed it makes sense to use that too. Uh, I think at the time we were uh, dealing with heads on the one hand and transmissivity on the other, I think it's at that time that uh, Alfries published his 1975 paper where he more or less started what became known as stochastic hydrology, where he, uh, you may remember this very famous paper, where he generated random values of uh, permeability uh, in, a, in a square domain and calculated heads. That was even on, on 1D. Uh in the 1D, wait, so it was a 1D calculation, and uh, he generated many realizations of the 1D transmissivity field and calculated the resulting head with two boundary conditions, prescribed heads at the ends. And what shocked us at that time, because we had already understood that concept that uh, transmissivities of permeabilities were not random variables uncorrelated in space, that Freeze had not considered at all uh, any correlation. Uh, we were also not the first to realize that. Uh, Lynn Gelhar, which we knew at that time and we had already had contact with him, uh, also had said, well, this is incorrect because uh, you do not account for the spatial correlation of the parameter in space. So I think this freeze paper in 75 uh, forced us to, to go into that direction of simulation right? and instead of doing simulation with uncorrelated variables, take into account the correlation in space, at this time we were only talking about transmissivity. And uh, the history, if I can say so, uh, went through a very nice Penrose conference, which was organized by Alfries in 1977, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. right. uh, where we all met. I mean, uh, Alfries, of course, was there, Lynn Gelhar was there, Alan Goodyear was there, Jean-Pierre and I and others from Fontainebleau were there. And the, the whole concept of uh, stochastic hydrogeology was put into a frame at that time. And it's during that Penrose conference, I believe, Jean-Pierre, that uh, you had the idea to prepare the uh, conditional simulations of transmissivities, which made your Water Resource Research 1977-79 paper on uh, stochastic simulation of transmissivity. Maybe you can... I, I, I just, I, I, I'm pleased you, you said the word, uh, the, the, the word shocked. It was a kind of shock because we, it was something like a, a, a very strong uh, uh, feeling about uh, the importance of spatial correlation that we had because we, 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 we got it uh, from, yeah, from, 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 from the Center for Social Statistics. We were convinced that it was the way to approach the, 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 the geological, uh, hydrological phenomena. And, and to see this 1D uh, non-correlated uh, suit, uh, suit a <laughs> series of numbers, it was something with like, like a shock. But uh, as, as, as you, you said, Guilain, uh, we were uh, more or less uh, um, benefiting from, from the advances in, in, in the center of geostatistics. We, we are the neighbor, they are neighbors and, uh, and very lucky to, to, to be so. And uh, for, in order to solve uh, mining problems, uh, Matron came to, to what uh, uh, he, he called uh, uh, conditional simulations, and uh, you already mentioned the, the word, which is uh, uh, the variance of uh, of uh, possible spatial distributions that are all consistent with the, the, the available data set. 
And he had, I mean, he and his team, and George Matron and his team, had in mind uh, mining applications, which mean uh, uh, 3D implementation of the of, of the concept, which is in terms of, a, of a computation. Uh, uh, what was the, the motivation to, to estimate the, volumes the, the, above the, the, a threshold? The, the, it was very. You say the mining people; they are very practical, practical, practically minded people, and so they they they, they realized without uh, any uh, theoretical uh, thinking that the estimates that were given by the, by Kriging were too smooth. Because he did not know about that, that it, it's obvious that any estimate is smoother than, than reality and all that. They, they did not know about the, the theory. But they just, they just um, um, saw it. On, on, it was not uh, 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 adapted to their need because they, they needed to have this kind of era, erratic uh, uh, variations in, in, in the... In the in, in the grade and in uh, all that you mean, a long time. Uh, geologists, engineers, in the in practice, the they were not yeah, happy yeah, with the, 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 the something which was smooth and which was predicting a kind of a, of a, a very quiet life where with a, with a, uh, slowly varying grades coming to 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 to, to, the, to the mill and, and all that. So they, they they were asking with something which looks real, looks real, and. Uh, but at the same time, that, that they, they had paid uh, so much for, for uh, uh, data acquisition that they wanted that this data set, this, uh, this, this numerical uh, model that, uh, that uh, uh, looks real also honors the data they, 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 they had paid for. So, and Matron came with, with the consumer simulation. And with a 3D mining oriented uh, uh, idea in mind. Uh, the problems that we had at that time, uh, aquifer simulation, except for the multi layer aquifer, were very often 2D problems. Uh, we also had a, a, a nice problem that uh, started to, to, uh, to pop up, uh, uh, which was the um, the uh, rainfall uh, uh, maps, uh, and all that was adapted to to uh, uh, an implementation of uh, Matron's idea in, in, in a two D framework, and that, that's what we did. So once that was 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 uh, re uh, was ready and tested on on, on rainfall da data, which, which which we started by by, by doing so. Uh, that then it was we, we had the, we had the the, the, the computational tools to move to the real uh, our, our real field of interest I would say uh, more than than, rent, than in precipitation uh, which was uh, log transitivity and so uh, that uh, that uh, that exactly corresponds to the to the the uh, the, the work that uh, Guillain you are you are describing is this, this kind of uh, WRR uh, paper in uh, in uh, in 79, published in 79. I would like to, just as, as a comparison, um, the other person who was uh, a little bit shocked by the absence of correlation in space of the log transmissivity that uh, Lynn had, uh, that um, Alfries had used, was Lynn Gellhar. Mm -hmm. And Lynn Gellhar uh, came to the notion of correlation of space of, and the random uh, nature of uh, transmissivity or permeability from a totally different perspective. He came from turbulence. And in turbulence, you have, you know, these cells that develop and change shape all the time. So it's stochastic. I mean, the concept of stochasticity is very well linked to turbulence because you see these things change and modify and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, the tools uh, had already been developed in the study of turbulence of the spatial correlation of the velocity and in a fluid where you have turbulence you can have local measurements of the velocity and then you can actually measure and see in space this this spatial correlation of a random process so their idea converged to exactly the same concept spatial correlation and stochastic processes but from a diff quite different perspective now in the in the paper which this 1979 
uh, simulation, stochastic simulation with Jean-Pierre starting to describe, uh, one thing which I believe is interesting, and is this is a little bit the philosophy we had in Fontainebleau, both at this, the group of Georges Matron and at our group in Hydro, is that uh, many of the problems stemmed from practical problems. And uh, the one particular problem which uh, we had in mind at that time was given by a place called Origny saint benoît which is a, a small valley in the vicinity of the Riviere Oise, near Paris. And this river has occasional uh, floods, which were very damaging for the downstream part. And uh, the idea came up that one should store that excess water which flowed in the river into a dam that has to be built uh, on the verge of the, of the river to protect the, the towns downstream. Now, it so happened that uh, the bottom of this potential dam was very pervious and uh, it was very uncertain if uh, the dam would store any water or if the water would be leaking directly into the very pervious chalk underneath and therefore the dam would be of no use of, at all. So, for practical reasons, it was impossible to make as many transmissivity or permeability measurements as it was been required to, to make good assessment, a good you know, uh, estimation, creeging estimation of the value of the permeability. There were maybe four, five, ten values of the permeability. Come on, we cannot describe a full basin. So, by discussing with the engineers which had in mind to build that dam, they say, well, can you give us a you know, a sort of a range of how, what's the chance that this dam will, can stay full or it will empty in a few days. So can you give us in kind of distribution of the probability? The, the question was really practical. Shall we build the dam? We'll not build the dam on one estimate of the permeability, whatever good it is. We want to see what is the range of possibilities. And this, I think, forced us to see, well, let's see, can we have alternative maps of the permeability of this dam based on the same measurements and the tool of doing stochastic simulations of the permeability of that area, given the few measurements we had and given the, co the covariance or the variogram that was, had been estimated for this thing. I think this is the real you know, argument that you use to, to try to, to develop this uh, method of conditional simulations. Yeah, the, 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 the 79 paper uh, was only mentioning these, uh, this need for uh, uh, a dual conditioning by both log transmissivity and head data. It was the kind of dream at the end of the, of the conclusion. Uh, and I remember uh, uh, very well a, a discussion we had uh, in the, the, the garden of, uh, of the center in Fontainebleau uh, with uh, Shlomo Neumann mm -hmm. uh, about this dream. He, were, he was sharing, all of us were sharing this, this, this dream. Mm -hmm. But as, as, as you said, Guilain, the, 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 the real strength of, uh, of, of Fontainebleau was that we had real problems to solve. And this Orini and Benoit the uh, problem was, was, was great because it, it... When was it? It was... It, it was... Late 70s? Yeah, late 70s, something like... A, uh, before or after the, be, be, the paper of Alan Fries? After. After. It was, it was after. It was... Uh, the, the, the estimation of the transmissivity map of Origny was in my thesis. In my 1978 thesis, I had the pilot point method applied to Origny saint Benoit. Mm -hmm. At the same time that uh, Jean-Pierre was doing uh, uh, conditional simulations yeah. of the head. Huh? Yeah. Uh, because the, the problem that Jean-Pierre wants to, to stress is that, in fact, the, there are two sources of uncertainty. One is the low number of measurement of transmissivity, therefore we have to interpolate and to interpolate by keeping the values on the points where we have measures. This is what is called conditioning, conditioning by the measured value of the transmissivities, and elsewhere we have variability and uncertainty. And then the second magnitude, which we need to solve the inverse problems and to improve the estimate of the transmissivity is the head. But the head has also measurement errors, measurement uncertainty, and also mapping uncertainty when you extrapolate that in space. Or when you have few data 
and you want to run an inverse, you may want to have an estimate of the head and use that estimate of the head in the inverse. And therefore, we have uh, what Jean-Pierre called the double conditioning. Mm -hmm. We want to be conditioned on the measured values of the transmissivities, and we want to be conditioned on the measured values of the heads, the heads being calculated with the transmissivity field that we have estimated. So you can put that problem either in an estimation framework, so you want one map, the best optimal map, or you, want, you may want to put it into the simulation approach, which to say, you know, we know there's uncertainty, we know there are not one single solution, and therefore we go to the simulation approach by doing the, 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 the method of uh, conditional simulations. And this, this very word of uh, uncertainty was uh, at, at the center of, uh, of uh, the, think, the thinking we, we had at, at that time in, in Fokelbo, because uh, the, the practitioners, I mean, in hydrogeology, uh, at that time, they were not very much concerned with, uh, with uh, let's say, uh, the theory or theoretical aspects. But this idea is that uh, the, how good were, was the forecast was starting to, 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 to come to their mind. Uh, because by that time, uh, for instance, for arid zones, uh, uh, we modeler, modelers were asked to, to, to give a long-term forecast. How good were they, those, those forecasts? So, so the, there was some, uh, some feeling that, that there may be something interesting in that. And uh, uh, one way to capture this, this uncertainty uh, was implemented for, for the first time on a practical uh, problem and in a practical manner uh, for Aurelius and Benoit. Because what, what uh, we did, uh, I started by, by producing uh, a series of, uh, of uh, uh, equiposable basimetric maps from the, the data of uh, the specific data of Elis and Benoit, and then I pass them to, to Guillain, who had the same, for each of, the, of, the, of those maps, applied uh, his, his, pilot point, his pilot point method for, for, for invert, inverting the, 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 those data. So he, he ended up with a series also of, of uh, electricity maps conditioned by both head and, and, uh, and uh, the few, very few low traffic data that we had. Uh, and then he could see how, how the forecasts were, were, were different mm -hmm. uh, based on, on those, those different uh, lock, lock, lock T uh, uh, maps. But when we are addressing this uh, Oris and Benoit uh, uh, issue, I just want to, 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 to say something that, that uh, is coming back to my mind, is that you learn, I mean, uh, you, we, we learn by, uh, we, we were learning at that time uh, in Fontainebleau by uh, a real combination of theory and, and, and practice. And uh, I guess if, if, uh, in Nicole Demin, that, that the motto, it's theory and practice, something like that, and, I guess. <laughs> and it, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, during that, that, that study, that very study, that, uh, we discovered by by chance something that uh, was uh, uh, let's say totally understood uh, ten years after or, or so by Matron when uh, uh, a lady called Anne Dong was uh, doing a PG work uh, w with him, and what what we saw without truly understanding what, what, what uh, was happening, uh, was the following. If you, if you consider that the, uh, uh, let's say, big word, uh, generalized, generalized co uh, covariance uh, function for the head does not vary in, in space over the entire aquifer, and if, if you use this, this single a covariance function or generalized covariance function uh, when producing your uh, conditional simulation, you get uh, maps 
that are not realistic. And in Orleans and Benoit, it was particularly true because of, uh, of the, the geology of this, 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 this place. You had um, a, a kind of uh, uh, aquifer with, with steps, because you have a, you have a kind of, uh, of stripes of high permeability and low permeability uh, uh, areas. And, uh, and if, if you took a single uh, covariance function, you uh, were overestimating the fluctuations in some zones and underestimating it in other zones. So uh, I first came back to, 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 the, to the center with, with my maps that were, I was not very pleased with, but it was the only one I could produce. And uh, Guillain and, and, and colleagues say, oh, oh, <laughs> so I came back to, to, to I, came, I came back to the computer. I came back to discussions with uh, with with uh, guys like uh, Jean Paul Chiles, uh, and uh, I, I realized that in fact I, I had to to uh, vary the, the the covariance functions the f function uh, as a function of of the overall slope of the aquifer. Uh, so it was kind of a change in, in, in the, in the regional slope. And I had to, 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 take in, to, to take that into account in order to, to have a, a kind of coefficient uh, uh, before my, 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 fu my function. A and everything was, was, was nice and, uh, and okay after, afterwards. And when I was saying it, Ten years after Matron, I, I don't know if he, he he had that in mind, kept it in what one part of his mind, or or it, he just got that from from pure theoretical uh, uh, reasoning. He, he ended up with uh, with Andong, uh, with the following result that the the um, there is a coefficient uh, uh, before the covariance function, which is not only of of, of a function of the uh, uh, the local uh, um, gradient, but he also gave exactly the expression of the, the, the relationship with this, with, with this gradient, the kind of uh, the, fi the famous j uh, uh, square j uh, square, and and and, uh, and uh, I, I guess it's something which which corresponds to to the way we we we. We progressed in Fontainebleau. It's by, it's by by experimenting, testing ideas, uh, without so, sometimes fully understanding uh, the, the, the 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 theories that, that had to be to be uh, further developed, but but made made things in progress. And then uh, I, I I I left the the, the center in uh, in, the, in 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 Haiti. And uh, from what, from what I uh, because I kept uh, in touch with, with, with you, uh, you 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 uh, even reach uh, further uh, steps in, in this evolution with this kind of uh, of uh, um, combination of uh, of the the, the condition simulation uh, uh, techniques and your pilot points uh, in order to, to get something more uh, more uh, let's say. If I can remember, <laughs> I think, uh, in fact, the idea of doing co creaging in the inverse, creaging on the measured transmissivities and the head, was first published by Peter Kitanidis. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the one who realized the same thing that both depend on the two values where you have to be conditioned on the two. And one very simple way to do that is to do co creaging. And you estimate the cross covariance between head and transmissivities, which is the nut of this thing. Uh, Lynn Gellar also developed equations, theoretical equations, to develop that coarse, coarse covariance between transmissivities and heads, which opens the way to estimation, simulation, whatever you want. Uh, so what we did in Fontainebleau at that time uh, is with uh, Shaquille Ahmed, who was an Indian colleague who came for a PhD thesis with me. Uh, the, and uh, he, he was in interested in co-creaging. So we tried first to do uh, 
estimation of transmissivity is based on transmissivity measurements and uh, geoelectrical measurements, geophysical measurements. So we had two sources of data, and so he made a, a number of methods of estimation of the transmissivity based on these two magnitudes, cross covariances and all that. And then we went into the Kitanidis problem, and uh, we used uh, an approximate co cross covariance function for the head, and we did this estimation, this uh, estimation based on measurements of transmissivity and measurements of head, and we didn't go to the simulation at that time with Shaquille, but we went to the simulation uh, with Marsh Avenue in the inverse problems applied in particular to the website. We have discussed that in the previous uh, interview, so I'm not going to go again on that, but that was the extension of uh, the inverse into the simulation problem. So we would not produce one single optimal map of transmissivity, but a series of alternative maps which would represent uh, the, the possible realization of the reality. Um, if I can make a little parenthesis on the story of geostatistics, is that obviously in the late 70s, early 80s, in Fontainebleau we had this whole group working on the stochastic method, on the estimation parameters and so on. And also, at the same time, I had published in France uh, a, a book which is called the uh, Quantitative Hydrogeology in French, which was the lecture notes I had given by my students at l'école des mines. And I, I met a colleague uh, whose name is uh, Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson was working at that time in Environment Canada, although he's American, now he's working with Interra. And he could read French because he had worked in Canada. And he had looked at my book and he said, well, it's interesting, you should translate that book. You should translate that book in, in English. But he told me, you know, uh, in America, what is being done in Fontainebleau is always very much focused on creeding and what Matron is doing. So if you do a book on hydrogeology in English, you should have a chapter in geostatistics. So with the help of Jean-Pierre, when I published and translated my book Hydrogeology Quantitative in English, Quantitative Hydrogeology, I included a, a, a long chapter on, on, on geostatistics. And a little bit of what we're discussing today was, was in that book. And uh, fortunately, this book became more or less well known in the US. And I think these two parallel ways, if I can say, the, the publication in Water Resources Research. I, I believe, uh, Jean-Pierre, your 1979 paper has been quoted thousands of times. Right? It's one of the landmark papers in, in uh, stochastic hydrogeology in doing its simulation. Uh, and the fact that geostatistic could be learned uh, by taking one of these books, not in the mining um, terminology, but in the hydrogeology terminology, makes, made it a little bit more easy for hydrogeologists to embark in this. this uh, and one also of the value of the book uh, that I, I mean, as, as a student, I came to your class. And I, I, before, I had classes of geostatistics during a full semester. And at the end of the full semester, we, we knew more or less how to do creaking. But I, I was shocked because I went to your class. And in two hours, we had done everything from the biography to the simulations. So it was also very, uh, how can I say, well focused with only the important steps. And in the book, you find that also, it's, it's something which is extremely valuable. Because it, this it's chapter, in fact, uh, I, I wrote it in 1979 during a, during a sabbatical in Tucson. And I was with Shlomo Newman and the, the group, and they had, you know, weekly seminars. And they, they said, well, you come from Fontainebleau, why don't you make a seminar on geostatistics? So, gosh. I have to <laughs> prepare things. So I was, you know, preparing all the, each week I was preparing a chapter on estimation of diagrams and so on and so forth. And this came out of the... It, it reminds me of a, a joke I made in, a, in a Tucson at another conference. I think it was in... I forgot exactly when, 80, 84, 85, I was invited. It was a conference on, uh, on uh, fractured rock hydrology. And I was making a presentation and I was in, in, using... Uh, uh, geostatistics, and uh, I saw that the audience was not quite aware of uh, what geostatistics is. So I said, you know, geostatistics are very important tools. 
I understand that uh, some of you may not know what it is, but it is never too late to go back to school. So I think the idea of giving seminars and making seminars on uh, geostatistics was something very important, and I did quite a number with the, with the ETH here in, in, in Switzerland, with the, the Delft Institute, uh, the Delft Hydraulics Laboratory in the Netherlands. We gave seminars on geostatistics, trying to, to you know, introduce the hydrologic community to the necessity of understanding a little bit of geostatistics. But one thing also, I mean, th there has been a lot of development um, by Lynn Gellar and others on, on analytical uh, results, uh, probability perturbation, and, uh, and, and apparently you have not entered too much into that, that part of the... Of well, the uh, what was it, I mean, wh why? why? Because... Uh, Probably I'm not uh, good enough in math to <laughs> that kind of complex... Uh, was it too far from the application, or...? Yes, uh, the, the, the work that Lynn did, and uh, Gideon Dagan also did, is, is really uh, very good for theoretical analysis, for theoretical understanding of what is the role of the uncertainty or the variability of this and this and that. But when you use stochastic analytical techniques, you cannot do conditioning. You cannot say, I want the field on which I'm going to work, to be conditioned by the measurement. This is a long, strong discussion we had with Lynn Gellhar when he came to Fontainebleau. The numerical method that we use and the, do, the doing of conditional simulations where you take into account the value at the measured point, this cannot be done with the analytical technique. Therefore, that refrained us to going too much to the, to the analytical technique. And Lynn said, well, yes, you're right, but you know there are so few measurements that does it matter? And probably not if you are going to, to try to develop you know, general understanding of what is the, the consequences of, of variability, for instance, on transport. How do you develop a, a macro dispers dispersion coefficient based on the variability of the underlying permeability field or transmissivity field? Then in indeed, it doesn't matter so much. But if you have a practical problem to solve and you have measurements here, the first thing you have to do is to honor these measurements and make, take, make them taken into consideration in, in the estimation or simulation. But contrary to what you said, I think the work of Anne Dong, who is not one of our students, it was uh, one of Macron's students, but uh, Anne Dong is, I believe, the first who really analyzed uh, correctly uh, in detail... Yeah, because she wanted to have the cross uh, yeah. correlation. Mm -hmm. What is the type of spatial correlation that can exist if you have spatial correlation, for instance, with the variogram uh, for the transmissivity, what is the type of tool, what is the cross covariance or the covariance which is consistent with that. And she made a very tremendous improvement of the understanding on showing that the degree of the generalized covariance of the mother function, which is transmissivity, on the daughter function, which is head, cannot be the same. You cannot have the same type of covariance, or the same type of, in fact, you have to go to generalized covariance to understand that. But she showed that all previous work which had been done by all these, you know, analytically oriented people had not understood that there's a different class of spatial correlation between the mother, mother product, transmissivity, and the daughter product, which is the head, and you have to he use different tools. This has not been realized. Uh, so I think it wanted to blow this possibility to make uh, advanced analytical development was present, not with me, but with Georges Matron, who made a very, very significant contribution, although it has not been well published, and it is not even today very well understood. Yeah, and and, and uh, this, this uh, dissertation is something, it's, it's, uh, as Guinan is, is saying, it's, it's not very easy to read. <laughs> But if you look at the formulae that, that, that uh, Anne was giving, and in particular if you look at the, the, sh the shape, the analytical, analytical shape of the cross covariance function, uh, and of, uh, of at the, 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 sh the shape, I would say, of the generalized covariance function for, for the A that is consistent with a, with a, a given. Uh, Covariance function for for uh, log t. 
if you stay a while looking at those formulae, I, 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 I promise you, you suddenly you, you have a, 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 a deep understanding of the, the, the way the, the different variables are linked which is, with each other. And uh, you, you, you start understanding the physics. So the, the, that, that's the beauty of, uh, of this kind of work that uh, Matron was able to do. It, it's, it, it's, it's mathematical work, but it, it gives access to a, a deeper understanding of the physics. And, and it's, it's something which is, which is, uh, which is really, uh, uh, we, 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 we are, I mean, I, I guess you, 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 you uh, will share this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this thing. We are very grateful to, to Georges Matron because he, he, he had this, 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 uh, this capability of, of being a kind of bridge between math and, uh, and, and physics, and, and, and he was kind enough to share it with, with us. <laughs> And, and, and something uh, uh, we have not uh, been addressing, you have not been addressing so far, uh, and uh, I cannot comment a lot because I, I, it was not my, my, my topic, was all this kind of, uh, of uh, work you, you, you made with Georges Matron about this version. Okay. And it, it's something which, which, which uh, is exact, exactly uh, a practical problem uh, encountered by... by uh, um, uh, hydrological uh, people, uh, people, people. Uh, then this kind of uh, uh, interaction between uh, Georges Matron and yourself, and, and, and at the end something that, that was uh, something like a, you could be captured in, in a sentence written in English or in French or in, in, in any language without any formula. That's that, you, that is at the end of your of your paper. Yeah. And I say, oh yeah. <laughs> But I can tell you a little bit about this. this um, I, at the time this, this occurred was just before, one year before the end of my PhD. Well, Dr. Adita in French. Um, I was working in the inverse and the pilot point and so on, so I had interaction with Matron to discuss that. And one day I was visiting him in his office. Matron is a very nice and gentle person. He says, oh, you're interested in hydrology, that's very nice. Well, he opens the door of his, of his office and the, he takes a paper, a one-page paper, handwritten. And he says, you know, some time ago, I, I worked a little bit on the problem of uh, mixing and dispersion. Maybe you'd be interested in looking at that. So he gives me that paper. Okay, he said, yes. So I try to read the paper. I understand nothing. Nothing. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know how you go from step one to step two. So I, you know, I get sweat on my forehead and uh, I work as far as long as like, as hard as I can. And then uh, maybe a week later, I go back to Matron and said, "Well, um, it's very interesting, but I'm not sure I can extremely understand very well." Oh yes, that's normal. You you are not a mathematician. You are a poor physical person. Let me explain to you. So he draws goes to the blackboard and he writes tens and tens and tens of equations and the more equations he writes, the less I understand. Uh, so I leave, <laughs> after half an hour I say, I'm lost. So what I did, and this is the way also Jean-Pierre worked at the center in Fontainebleau, I go and see some of the colleagues of Matron who have more, you know, habit or are more used to work with him. And I tell, can you help me here? I don't understand. And they had a little bit more understanding of the way Matron reasons and uh, works. And the first line of equation, of course, this was the basic equation. And the second line, in fact, you needed 10 lines of development of the detail of the equation to understand. So you had one equation every 10, which was in, and the, the rest you had to, you know, reconstruct, yeah. reinvent. So they show me how it, uh, it goes, and eventually I, I finish by, by understanding what's going on. And uh, so I saw that this was very interesting because uh, at the same time, the, the, to make it clear, the issue is uh, what is the behavior of a tracer injected in a layered, infinite parallel layers uh, aquifer, uh, each permeability of each of the layer being different. Huh? What kind of dispersion do you get in the end? And uh, it, it's been a problem that at the same time, in 1978, uh, Lynn Gellhar and uh, one of his uh, 
student had worked on the macro dispersion and he had shown that if you knew the covariance function of the permeability along the layers, and if this covariance function was what we call the uh, whole effect covariance function, which is covariance which would go positive, then negative, and back to zero, which means that the integral of the covariance function was zero, Lin had published an analytical expression of the value of the dispersion coefficient for such a medium. But he didn't say that, but of course this was a really very special case, because you had to assume that you had this covariance function, which was a zero integral covariance function, which is very rare. So Matron hadn't, hadn't read, read, hadn't read or hadn't looked at, uh, at Gelhar's work, but he had addressed that problem, you know, maybe 10 years earlier. It was sitting in his desk in, in a sheet of paper that no one had ever looked at. So I had the luck to, to look at that, to understand what was going on. And it's at the time that I had the luck, the good luck, to go for a sabbatical in Tucson. And I brought this, this paper that I had understood a little bit, and I worked the paper which was published in 81 with the help of Shlomo Newman. We worked, in, we, uh, we worked a little bit on that, and uh, eventually we, ha we arrived at this paper which called Is uh, Transport Diffusive? Always Diffusive? Uh, and of course, if we used for the covariance of the vertical velocities of the ver ve velocities in the vertical layers, or in the horizontal layers, if we had any other type of covariance, one could show that indeed there was no constant dispersion coefficient, but that the dispersion coefficient was growing with space along the transport of, of the solute. So this was new. At that time, the idea that the dispersion coefficient was not a constant was around, but it was understood as, you know, a lack of ergodicity. In other words, well, maybe there's too much variability at the start, but eventually you will get a constant dispersion coefficient. And that was it. That was the understanding. And with this paper by Matron, which I worked on, but the idea came from Matron, we showed that indeed, if depending on the type of covariance, you had the possibility that dispersion would go to infinity as far as the transport developed. Uh, also, we published at that time, uh, the, on the same paper, the concept that if the velocity was not strictly parallel to the bedding, but there is a little bit of a transverse component of the velocity, then you would get, in any case, some leveling off of the dispersion coefficient. You would get the constant coefficient after a while. So th this was... A uh, maybe we should close this discussion because we have been talking for a long time, but I see in front of us, this bottle, and if I don't know if this has been shown in the in the movie yet, but uh, I think it'd be a little story to show, <laughs> to to close this discussion. Uh, this goes back to the presentation I did of my PhD thesis or my doctorat d'état in Paris at the Ecole Normale Supérieure on the twenty first of December nineteen seventy eight. The university was closed. That for I uh, uh, defended at the Ecole Normale. And I had a public, uh, in, in France, uh, the defense of a, do a doctoral degree is always public. So you have a, a large number of friends and colleagues who come. You have an audience of maybe 10, 20, 30, 50, I don't know how many we were. Well, it was a, it was a large audience of those days. <laughs> so the title of the thesis was uh, Identification of Hydrologic Systems. And I talked about the inverse problems of, of deconvolution, of transport, uh, the, this, this paper with Matron on transport in uh, layered media. But I wanted to have the public understand what is a stochastic post medium. Uh, so the day before, or no, the night before the defense, I had this idea that I should collect a little bit of a sample of sand and show the audience. Uh, here's the sand. So this is nice sand. You can see there are grains, there are voids, and so on. And, uh, well, you can describe the structure of this medium by the connection of the sands and grains and bodies and so on. So this is one medium. Now, I think, now, this is another one. It's the same, but it's different. So this is what we call, in hydrogeology, one realization of a stochastic power medium. Of course it's the same, but at each time I shake it, 
you get a second realization. So it was a way to present to the public what is <laughs> a realization of a stochastic process. I think it had some impact because uh, in his uh, book on geostatistics, Will Define, Jean-Paul uh, Jean 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 Chiles uh, Jean uh, tells a little story <laughs> about the, the shaking of a bottle stand to make people understand what is a stochastic medium. Maybe it's a good transition to, uh, to another topic. You, uh, after a while, when you came to Paris, you were still interested in stochastic porous media or stochastic geology, and then you, you worked with Vanessa Teles on alluvial aquifers and another way to build stochastic models. So I think it would be interesting to, to talk about that. Yes. Um, and why you did that and what was the... Uh, I, I would say that uh, the approach I had worked initially on was purely geostatistics. And um, I don't know exactly when, but in the mid-80s, I would say, uh, Jean-Pierre came back to Fontainebleau for visit one day, and uh, he introduced me to the Boolean methods of generating random media. And you, you know the what's called the stochastic shale, the yeah, work of Halderson in the oil industry, something completely new to me. So I realized that there was you know, some, something else in life than just your statistics. There were other ways, other methods, to generate or to represent the variability in space of uh, the properties of a medium. And uh, the, the Boolean method, where you generate objects that you sample and so on, is an alternative way. I never worked really with, uh, with the Boolean methods in practice, but it opens you know, the range of uh, ideas you can have on. And then I met with uh, Steve Gorelick, in Stanford during a second sabbatical I had in Stanford in 1995, I believe. And that was the time that he had just published this paper in Science with, uh, uh, what's her name? Colterman. Huh? Colterman. Colterman, yes. Colterman and Gorelick, where they did this uh, uh, simulation of the deposition of sediments in the San Francisco Bay using uh, a method which was based on the work of Harbo which is the set sim approach, which is to say the modeling of the sedimentation process of uh, depositing sand or gravel, and uh, eventually you build up an aquifer by simulating the sedimentation process. And I found that superb and very fascinating because it was the third way. You had the geostatistic on the one hand, you had the Boolean approach, you had a combination of both and so on, but this is, was the third approach. You could generate variability in space of, of the properties of an aquifer by actually representing the process that led to uh, the accumulation of the sediments. So when I returned from uh, this sabbatical in, in 95 in, in Paris, you know, although I liked the approach very much, I realized that doing the actual transport of sand in an in a, in a river for 600,000 years, giving the flow rate day after day, minutes after minutes, giving the amount of sand which was transported by the river. You know, this was impossible to reconstruct precisely, uh, you know, what was the history of the sedimentation. Therefore, would it be possible to find a sort of a simplified approach to do the same thing based on the more empirical approach to the modeling of the sedimentation. This is the work that was done by Vanessa Teles, which started just after my return from, from uh, Stanford, where we used a semi-empirical, we have a little bit of physics of um, moving around of uh, channels in, uh, in a, we, we modeled a, uh, an alluvial plane and um, we developed concepts for uh, differentiating between uh, braided uh, streams and uh, meandering streams. And uh, at that time, this was just at the moment where papers we, were being published about the MADE experiment in the US, where you remember a large tracer test was done on, on, the, uh, on the river uh, in the place called MADE, and uh, they had very difficult problems. This was uh, you know, initiated by Lynn Gellhar, and they wanted to check 
the growth of the dispersion coefficient with distance. So they had to understand the correlation in space of the heterogeneity in the aquifer. But then they had made the assumption that the main aquifer was, you know, a sedimented type of aquifer and, and that they were treated as one unit. And in fact, if you look at the details, and this is a, a young colleague from the Netherlands whose name was uh, Joost, who told me, but wait a minute, I mean, this river, you have a first layer, which is a meandering stream, and overlaying on that, it's another layer deposited by a graded stream. So if you mix that into one single unit and try to make statistics of the correlation in space of these things, I mean, you are mixing apples and oranges. That doesn't make sense. So this was also an incentive to see if we could develop a code that could treat differently sedimentation episodes when it was meandering or braiding. So we joined with the sedimentologist, Jean-Paul Bravard from Lyon, who was very much familiar with the sedimentation processes in the Rhône Valley, and he was able to describe the succession of braiding and meandering and braiding and meandering over 15,000 years. And, it, you know, for long, for several thousand years, you had braiding and then you had meandering and this and this and that. So we tried to reconstruct this heterogeneity by taking into account this very fundamental concept. Is this a braiding stream or a meandering stream? And for each, we developed semi-empirical methods that would represent in the braiding, and the braiding was represented essentially by a Boolean technique, and the meandering one was represented by a stream whose shape and the contours was changing with time by giving erosion rules and deposition rules which were more or less empirical. So the, the whole concept of developing a genetic, I call it genetic approach to the heterogeneity was developed after this, uh, this long uh, sabbatical at Stanford with Steve Gorelick. And now, I mean, is it used? Is it used, this technique? Uh, it is, you know, I think it, it, it helps colleagues uh, develop other concepts. And I don't think the model itself is used, no. Vanessa is still working at the French Institute of Petroleum on other concepts, other approaches. But, um, well, in, in, in the US, um, Webb uh, worked with uh, Marie Anderson uh, to, at uh, what's an university? Uh, uh, Madison, at Madison. They, they developed a, sort of a similar book. They did it before us. Uh, Webb published his paper on a sort of an uh, empir empirical uh, or approximate method of generating streams, you know, with the same concept. I don't think his model is used either, but, you know, somebody else... I agree, in fact. The, the, the idea, this idea of making simplified, and this is also what we have been talking about, cast. The, the idea of making, let's say, pseudo-genetic ap approximation of the genesis using some simple stochastic models, but combined in the way, uh, this is something which is now done, and, and you were one of the first to, to propose this idea. Yeah. And the idea has been followed yeah. by, by different teams and yeah. in different ways. Uh, but, uh, uh, what I know in France is a, a guy in, uh, at the French Institute of Petroleum who modeled uh, turbidites. And he did that in a more or less similar way. Uh, a little bit of empirical, a little bit of transport of sediments in, in a turbidic flow. And the latest I know of is a, a PhD student who defended her thesis in last September, so not too long ago. Her name is Laure Lègle, who uh, did the same type of approach, and she's representing uh, storm deposits at sea. So again, it's an empirical method, and uh, what you realize is that uh, in, we worked on the Gulf of Lyon. Uh, you get sediments which are put into suspension by, uh, by large waves, when you have a, a hurricanes and so on, so we have a lot of suspension from the bottom of, of the ocean. And then the general current of the waves push the sediments towards the, the, the deep ocean. Uh, and they are deposited, and uh, granulometry is a function of, of their size and so on, and you get heterogeneity generated by this process. So we modeled that. She did a model that represents erosion, sedimentation on the seashore. It's different equations, it's a different type of empirical approach, but it's the same concept. You, know? you can generate heterogeneity by having a genetic model run, which is more or less complex and does more or less 
uh, exact representation of the physical processes going on. And I think this concept, I don't think the models themselves have of any interest. It's just a concept and it goes from the next to the next student to the next approach and eventually it goes to something uh, which can be applied. But yet, at this stage, Vanessa's work, I don't think it's being applied. But this is not the role of, of, of uh, you know, uh, doing research in the university. You want the concept to be, to be innovative and to be, uh, you know, having possibilities to be applied later on, but not necessarily as at the outcome of the first thesis. 